You spend a few dollars and you get frustrated a little bit. Let me uh, let me get this started up here a little bit. Let's uh, let's see what you came for. There you go. How does that look? A little Buck Rogers up there. Try to squeeze a lot in the slide. Try to make this a little bit quicker so we have time for some questions. As you know, this is our live streaming room. So I want to thank Jeff and OEP. Thank you, Jeff, for all your work. And Gary, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate all your help putting this together. Jeff's car is another story. So, so today, try not to snore too loud. And I hope you find all the information that I present to you very entertaining and enjoyable I mean that would help a little bit thank you so I appreciate it very much well this is the 16th anniversary of ham radio University and uh, it was a brainchild of Phil n2 mun which we internally thank for that <clears throat> and she's she's turned 16 so what do you do with a 16 year old C16 kind of tough to now raise it from here on out but I know you guys and the team will do a a really good job, really. I joined AMSAT in 2008. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to be able to be at a field day seminar and a field day opportunity at Radio Central. And as a result of that, I really got excited about it. What do I do with this? Just let me just cross this out, get rid of this here. Will that, will that blow anything up? OK. There you go. OK. Anyway, so with a little help from a lot of people and many satellite contacts later, I volunteered as a New York State Area Coordinator for AMSAT. And also I'm the Congressional Liaison for AMSAT as well. What that means as the Area Coordinator, I go around the state of New York, more and more now trying to raise funds for, for AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, because we're in, in certainly desperate need for funding. But certainly the fun part is, is showing folks how to take some of their equipment that they're not using anymore, maybe they're no, no longer interested in repeater work, and they'd like to get involved in the satellites. So it's my task and, and my enjoyable time to be able to spend time with them, to show them how to set that up, and really how to really maybe just listen or maybe work with telemetry. So there's a lot of different aspects of, of what you can do, really. I'm curious, just with a show of hands, how many folks here uh, have been an amateur about one year? Any one year? One year. Congratulations. Well, tell me. What got you involved in, in amateur radio? Why did you choose amateur radio? Um, computers. Computers, okay. Computers. Thank you. How many, anyone here in the room has been an amateur operator for 30 years? 30 years. Congratulations, really. What's your call? K2MIJ. And your name? Jim. 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 What, what got you interested in the hobby? Uh, honestly, when I was about eight or nine years old, I uh, discovered Shore Wave Radio. And what was it about it that drew you into it? Uh, ability to send signals without any wires. Yes, it's fascinating, isn't it? You never get tired of it. The one thing that you never hear, I rarely hear in presentations, is I got involved because I like to show my hobby to people. You don't hear a lot about that. Because most of us spend our time in the shacks. We're below ground a lot of times. We're away from people. They don't see us. We don't have to talk to them. Or we're in our car and we're encased in, in our car and we don't have to talk to people either. So that's something that you kind of have to acclimate yourself to a little bit. As an example, I'm, I'm at uh, Jones Beach and I'm doing a, a satellite contact. Now, you know the pass is about eight minutes, so you don't have a lot of time to do a pass. Let me show you a typical pass. So I don't have the radio here, but make believe this is a radio for now. So I'm here at Jones Beach and of course it's a nice sunny day and I like the beach because you know, I don't need a lot of power, really. I've got the horizon. It's only a 20-degree pass, so I have the opportunity. So I'm there, and the person says, what are you doing? Well, I said, I'm an amateur radio operator, and I'm uh, working through the amateur satellites, talking with people on the other side of the signal. But who's up there? Who's in that satellite? I said, no, no, no one's in the satellite. We're just talking to someone through the transponder, and someone on the other side of the country, or maybe in another country we're talking with. And I'll say, this is W2JV, a KYSED copy. Excuse me. Yes. 
by the way, who, so who's working the satellite up there? I said, uh, Jimmy Hoffa. He's up there in the satellite. So that's the thing you have to contend with. So it's, it's not the technology that's so difficult to embrace in our hobby. Not at all. It's really to understand that you have to work with other people. You have to get out there with the public and talk with them really quite a bit. So that's sometimes something you have to really get used to. One of the questions that I'm, that I'm often that I'm often asked really is overall the question comes down to why can't AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, put a HEO satellite in orbit? That's a high Earth orbit. We haven't had one since AO10. Certainly it's okay, it's exciting to put satellites up in LEO orbit, but why aren't you putting satellites in HEO orbit? A high orbit. And of course this kind of explains a little bit why that, why that is really occurring overall. So I hate to start the presentation with a scary face, but really it is a new reality that, that we're existing right now. The P3E, which is built and ready to be launched to a GTO orbit, would cost $10 million today. $10 million. So we can build the satellite, which is built. We have all the technology, but we, we can't get a ride. We can't find someone to give us $10 million or a government to give us $10 million. Now the small sat to, to really the, the LEO orbit, now that was in 2004, that was AO51. Now AO51 in today's dollars would cost $3 million. Now AO51 was a pretty big package. It weighed about, about 20 pounds. But that's what we cost today just to put that small satellite into a LEO orbit. Arasat, average radio board, the International Space Station would cost one million dollars. Now in 2011, we were able to, to put that package up there and it was hand launched by, uh, by, by one of the astronauts. And uh, that satellite, of course, was in a low LEO orbit and it just lasted a, a couple of months. But we got a free ride because we were partnering at the time with the university. So it was an educational launch of a nano satellite, Alana, and it didn't cost us anything. But the problem with that is you have to wait quite a long time for a manifest to be able to get yourself into orbit. The microsat to LEO orbit is 500,000 and the one U CubeSat to LEO is 100,000. This here is a one U CubeSat. This is a replica of the Fox 1A satellite that will be put into orbit uh, in the third quarter of, of this year. This is a four by four by four, 10 centimeter satellite and it has room for experiments. It has about nine uh, different uh, PC trays, and uh, it'll do pretty much anything that the uh, AO-51 did. And this is third quarter. This weighs about 2.9 pounds versus AO-7 here that weighed approximately uh, 65, 65 pounds. So now that one you CubeSat, we have, we AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, by the way, it sounds like a corporation with a lot of people, is one paid employee, Martha, the office manager, and that's it. The rest of us are volunteers. So we have committed AMSAT itself without going through the funding, without going through NASA, without writing proposals to, to launch a satellite. So we have the satellite built. Fox 1C has been built and um, we have taken out of our reserves money to be able to launch the satellite. Now, Just tell it on the bottom one. Yeah, tell it on the bottom one. Right. The bottom one. Perfect. Thank you. And so <coughs> we're committing to launch it. Hopefully we'll be able to raise enough funds to be able to, to really recoup that. So there's two parts of the question, really. How do we put a satellite in orbit? First is how do we keep AMSAT going, really? Because as of September 14th, we have 2,901 members. But that's a loss of 600 members, 600 from 2008. And of course, there's a lot of reasons for it. We have fewer satellites in orbit, aging population, people may not want to join. It's a common problem we have in, in all organizations. But the membership dues, they're not there to support really our satellite launches. It's strictly our annual operating expenses. What's that? Martha's salary. She hasn't had a raise in five years, by the way. Our periodicals, our AMSAT journal. Costs quite a bit to have it mailed. That's mailed quarterly, the AMSAT journal and uh, some other office rent as well. So that's really the expenses that, that 
we're, we're up to. So really, part one of the answer, then how do we keep amateur radio in space? Part two, really, is what we're doing now. The way to get to orbit is with grants. We work with universities. We're working with Penn State right now, and Penn State will be the first university that we're going to fly with, and that's the third quarter in FOX 1A. Uh, they're putting their MEMS gyro experiment aboard. Vanderbilt is putting their JPEG camera experiment. Hopefully they'll have that done by, by launch time. And we put our, our grants in, and, and we work through NASA, and we're going to be able to get a flight with 1A and 1B, really. But the problem with that is you never guaranteed a spot on the spaceship. You know, you could be bounced or a paying customer. And as we know, CubeSats have become a very popular method of, of getting satellites cheaply into space. So it has been embraced. It was, in, it was invented and conceived by a number of professors at Stanford and San Jose State University, came up with the CubeSat idea. But the commercial interest of finding that they can, they can put a small package into space. So we have a lot of competition. So Fox 1C is who we're funding ourselves. But that's how we're getting into space these days, through the, the Elena project, really. This is the actual, this is the Fox 1 engineering prototype. Did, have any of you gone to ARRL Centennial at all? Did you go to the AMSAT booth and see the actual working model of FOX-1? Pretty phenomenal. We have FOX-1 there, and you could, you could key it through your HT. But that's, that's, the, that's the FOX series. We're hoping that uh, we're going to prove through our successful space venture that FOX-1 is a good package, and hopefully we'll have other universities really working with us. Because the university will work with their science program. Once their science experiments are over, they'll turn the satellite over to AMSAT, and then we'll be able, at that point in time, to have it go into transponder operations. <coughs> so that's really how, how that will work. We, we build it, we put their experiment on, experiment on board, and then we're allowed to also put, put our, our own transponder on board. So a quick commercial. Join AMSAT 12 cents a day. Think about it, $44 a year. You'll get a copy of the AMSAT journal. You'll have an opportunity for some books at cheaper prices, getting started with, with satellites, which is really good. So that'll help us at least solve our administrative expenses. Because what we're doing now is we are digging into reserves. We're taking money that we should be using to launch a satellite, and that money we're using to, to our normal operating expenses. So that, you know, that could go on only so long. Really. There's just some of the books. You get discounts on, on some of these books. And uh, if you want to contribute $100, you can, uh, you can get the Fox <laughs> coin, which uh, I have somewhere over here, the Fox 1C coin, which uh, is kind of a, kind of a, neat, a neat little thing. There's the, there's the coin. AMSAT, in the front, AMSAT Fox project. And on the back of it is a copy of our Fox 1C CubeSat. Nice little thing. Weighs a couple of pounds. There you go. Doesn't fly yet. <laughs> but it's a nice, it's a nice <coughs> opportunity to give to, uh, to AMSAT and help us all out overall. Well, we are here to learn how to get into space, aren't we? Really. We're here to dust off some of that equipment and get flying. So you can tell people that I was in outer space. It's good to leave uh, the troposphere once in a while, really. You know, just a little history, really. Pretty phenomenal how we were so close to Sputnik. What was Sputnik's signal? What was Sputnik? Because Sputnik sent a code. Well, what was it called? Actually, yeah, they sent a code. But more importantly, they had Sputnik. What does it translate to? Hi. Say it again? Hi. No, that's, that's, that's close. How about uh, to serve man? That was Twilight like Zone. Thank Twilight you, Twilight. thank you. Okay. <laughs> Traveling companion. Traveling companion was what Sputnik loosely translated to. Then four months later, we better get going, we, we, we launched Explorer 1. What did Explorer 1 discover? Van Allen. Van Allen Belt, thank you, Phil. Correct, which helped us a great deal and to understand what satellites were going to do once they were, you know, in, in the ionosphere. And of course, 1961, four years after the launch of Sputnik, Oscar 1 was launched in orbit for, uh, for 22 days. How did that all, all come about, really? It is quite an extraordinary history, and it's something if you get a chance to read space today online, some of the archived items, you'll get a little idea of some of the background, really. We've launched amateur satellites, 85 amateur satellites have been uh, launched since 1961, really, certainly starting with, with Oscar, Oscar 1 and going from there. How it all started, Don Stoner was a, was a well-known CQ columnist, and he wrote an article in CQ 
1959. They said, you know, wouldn't it be a good idea to build a satellite to put into orbit, but not just a beacon, have it, have it so that people could speak to it. So at that point, Fred Hicks read that article. Fred Hicks worked for TRW. He had a lot of Air Force connections. He was fascinated by what he read in that article from Don Stoner, and he put the ball in motion, and he started Project Oscar in 1960. The Project Oscar was very active from 1960 until 1969, responsible for the start, Oscar I, Oscar II, Oscar III. But as a result of that, that CQ article, Fred Hicks picked it up, started Project Oscar. George Jacobs, another columnist, this is now 1968, a columnist for CQ magazine, was at a radio convention. Perry Klein was in the audience. He said, you know, Project Oscar had not launched anything since Oscar three, and they run out of steam. Perry Klein in Washington, D.C. was so excited by what he heard, the next day he got a group of people together and they put together AMSAT. So in 1969, AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, was, was founded, really. So just a, a little background in history. So now I guess it's, it's comparing and contrasting. You know, a lot of people, they look at a satellite and all of a sudden they wonder, oh boy, space science, I'm not going to get this stuff. This is not going to be something I'm going to enjoy. I like to push buttons. But it really isn't too different. How do you compare and contrast a repeater? Well, how do we compare? One signal is allowed through at a time. We're talking now about the FM repeaters. So this talk is about our FM satellite, or SO50 right now, one at a time. So that's similar. It transmits what it hears. There's a similarity there. It has optimal receivers and transmitters. Okay, that's the comparison to that. Good location, we always like to find a good location for our repeater. And it allows for extended communications using a terrestrial repeater. Now how does it contrast overall? Well, it has a moving footprint. So that sometimes freaks people out and it moves. How am I going to track it with this little antenna? So that's one difference, moving footprint. Full duplex, so we have simultaneous uplink and downlink on different bands. That's a difference. Really, multi-mode. So other than just doing side FM, we can do sideband, we can do CW, we can do digital, and we can do SSTV. Now, in order to do that, that will require a radio that's capable of all band, all mode radio, like you have. A little more money, but that's just another another step. Worldwide coverage. A little difference between a terrestrial repeater and our satellite. The frequency changes due to Doppler shift. That's a difference between the two. And also the polarization changes due to Faraday rotation. Now I'll say, what's Faraday rotation? Well, Faraday rotation basically, it's doing, you'll see it later, doing a wrist wiggle. Faraday rotation is because in the ionosphere signals now have become, become basically change because of the ionospheric conditions on it and it'll go from left to right. So a signal that, that comes in uh, the satellite that's on the left side will come back down to Earth on the right side. So all you have to do is really make the wiggle change left and right. A lot of people don't really kind of get that. What the, the problem they're having when people say to me, I'm not able to copy SO50. I'm having a lot of difficulty with it. The problem is they have it on a tripod which is very comfortable but they're not able to move it left and right. So they're not really being able to hold the signal for very long and they're losing you know, a lot of range with it. So it's important to understand that you have to change it. I have some pictures that'll, that'll show the difference overall. Also the power budget. We need about 850 milliwatts. That's all we need for our satellite. That's about maximum 850 milliwatts. So, I, so we know that a repeater, a terrestrial repeater needs a little bit more than, than that overall. So those are just some of, the, some of the differences that we have. There you see the progression, really. We talked about the 64 pounds versus 2.9 pounds and the size difference and like everything else in life, really. So what do we do? Well, there are three types. The analog FM repeater operation, VHF, UHF. That's something that we do, basically, with our satellite operations. The analog, the sideband, the CW transponder operation as well, we do. And the digital operation. There are folks that really rather just do telemetry downloads. They want to learn about the health of the satellite. 
So what they're doing really is just copying telemetry. And it's just a, it allows them an opportunity really to track more satellites. And so that's another opportunity that, that you, you can have overall. There's a little bit of, a, of one particular, our sat when we launched it, that was a, it's a telemetry software that we had. And you can see that it's, this is typical battery voltage, current. Really, it's, it's checking all the health of the satellite. And the, and the control stations want to know around the United States, as an example, what does my satellite look like when it's in New York, in the sun? What does it look like in California when it's now eclipsed? I want to know what the battery is doing. How much is it discharging? What's the temperature of, of the satellite? So it's important, and that information that we give to them really is, is critical in the operations. Now, the orbits, really, well, SO50, you know, is in a low Earth orbit, right, right there, just, just right around the Earth. And its aperture, you can see 713 kilometers by 603. <coughs> That's about going to be where we're going to be with FOX-1, about that kind of altitude. We're going to be inclined at about 64 degrees, so we'll have an opportunity to be in the sun most of the time. It's going to be a sun-synchronous orbit for a FOX-1. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to, those batteries will be charged most of the, most of the time. Well, this admits, people wonder a little bit. Well, a lot of people come in with preconceived notions. The first thing they say is, I gotta read a lot before I really get involved. And a lot of people think that. They think I gotta learn as much as I can before I get involved in the satellite operation. You really don't have to do that. Or I've gotta be smart like Sheldon. This is Sheldon's costume, the most accurate representation and visualization of a scientific principle, right? He's the Doppler effect there. At least he thinks he is on that, is Sheldon. And of course, a lot of people think that you have to learn a lot of, a lot of terms and all. We know what OSCAR means, right? Orbital Satellite Carrying Amateur Radio. So many people know this answer, so you refrain from it. But what does OSCMIL, O-S-C-M-I-L, mean? Anyone have a guess at that? Something to do with your mother-in-law? That's right. <laughs> Very popular. Thank you. Yes. Orbiting satellite carrying mother-in-laws. It's a satellite that uh, has a long, long waiting list, really. <laughs> and one-way ticket to space, really. The other thing people thought, well, we had to really, you know, it's difficult to find where it is. This is something that we used back in the 70s. Oscillator, they called it. before pretty incredible and you get a headache and you say you know I think I'd rather go back to HF it's I, more comfortable there what I want to do with this stuff <laughs> thank, thank right thank God for Androids and SAT PC 32 really I want to thank K2OBS Jay he, he gave me this this is really good shape. Shape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't think he used it <laughs> I don't think he used it a lot many people really. <laughs> right but we don't have to worry about that you think you need a lot of antennas well you really don't really and you think you need a lot of equipment, really. And you don't have to wear a white shirt anymore. You had to know that. You had to have your hair cut short to really be, I guess it wouldn't pass you if you didn't have your hair cut short. And of course, the typical equipment that we use, that's my radio, an FT-50. Now this is the basic operations. One radio, an elk antenna or an arrow antenna, is, is basically one way. So you're not going to hear yourself. Now we prefer duplex so that you don't have to guess am I in the repeater or not. But to start off with, and I encourage it, one radio with two, two VFOs, just maybe to listen to a pass of SO50. So that might be a, that could be a start for you, really. Now, in addition to that, basically, it's a one dual band radio, really, that can do split frequencies. There are a bunch of them out there. Thanks to both fangs and the, the Woxums, you can really now do duplex pretty cheaply. If you want to receive only, you have capabilities just to receive only using dongles if you want, or scanners. And you can use a scanner and your, your, your radio, your dual band radio, as a cheap way to really do a, a duplex operation <laughs> overall. So now, what are comparing and contrasting differences? Well, one dual band HT, you're working SO50, or the International Space Station, prior to some school contacts, you'd be able to hear some of the astronauts, especially if they're going to be doing uh, not a telebridge contact, but a radio contact, they'll be on the air, so you can work with that. The problem is, yeah, can you hear me? You don't know if you're in the repeater, in, in the satellite or not, because you're not hearing yourself. So there's a bit of a disadvantage with, with that. So two HTs now with SO50, now you can hear your downlink. But what a difference it makes. Why does it make such a difference? Well, 
As I said before, because of the Faraday rotation, when you're working with one radio, you're not really sure what to do to improve your signal. Well, what I find is all you have to do maybe is tilt the antenna to the left or to the right or lower or raise it, and you'll hear your signal come through the transponder. So it really is a great tuning aid to get yourself in there and stay in there for quite, quite a bit of time as, as well. So that's the two HTs. Now the all mode VHF, UHF, two radios, that's of course where now you, you know, you're able to copy now our, our linear satellites, AO7, FO29, AO73, and of course all, all the other digital satellites as well. Now you're talking about people have got two FT817s as an example. That's for another talk to talk about how you can expand it. But a lot of folks are finding F17s on eBay where they're blown finals. And now they can use that as their receiver only <coughs> and, and find uh, a cheap FT817. So that's one way to do it. Or of course you go all the way with all mode VHF station like. But Bill has a 9100 and living nice, living right. That's for sure. So that's, that's the progression that you can make through it really. But it's all up to you, know, to you where you want to go with this. Now, antennas for satellite operations, of course, there's our, he's, he's holding, I don't know if he's going to be able to do this very I don't know if he's shooting somebody or trying to reach the satellite, but he's not going to last very long. It's going to hurt his arm, really. But uh, there he is. Uh, they do things in California differently. But he's, he's got his, his elk antenna. Here's a guy in his, in, his, in his room. That's the way to go. Nice and comfortable, which you can, really. And, of course, the Diamond SRH 789 that's one example, one quarter, five-eighths wave. You can use an extended whip if you want, but you'll need a pretty good horizon at that point. You'll need to perhaps be, you know, at the beach or in Phoenix, Arizona, to be able to, to do that for, uh, for satellite operations. So now, you're planning and preparing. That's kind of the, the key overall to really having a good, a good path. So what's the first thing we do? Well, first thing we want to do is we want to learn a little bit about the satellite that we're going to be able to receive, SO50, as an example. So that's the satellite that we're going to try to receive. There's a picture of it over there. And what we're looking for is the uplink frequency, 145-8500, with a PL tone of 67 hertz, downlink 436-795. And you get a little background about, about that satellite when it was launched. Here's the satellite that was launched in 2002 and just had a life, they said, life expectancy of about three years. And SO50 is still doing a terrific job, and it's uh, a nice satellite to work. So that's the first thing you can do in your planning step. And this is on the AMSAT website. You go there, and you do the drop-down menu, uh, under satellite status and it'll show you what's going on. You see where it says passes over there? That's the next step. You go there and now you're going to want to know about really what pass should I go on? Okay, you're going to look here. Okay, here's the passes you know for, for January 4th and 5th as an example and you look at the maximum elevation over there. You'll try to find something really especially on your first pass, something around 37 degrees is nice. So there's one of course, that's, that's UTC time. That's a little early in the morning, so you may not want to do that. Here's one, uh, you know, 155. So probably you'll pick uh, 10, 00, 07, 25 degrees. And now you'll see the maximum elevation at azimuth and at uh, LOS, loss of signal, as well. And that's important because what you want to do is you want to know, well, where is the satellite going to be in the sky? So now you'll do that. So now you know that that's the date I'm picking. That's the time I'm picking. And there's the, uh, where the satellite's going to be in the sky. So you'll now get that sense overall. Now, you could also use SatPC32, a nice software program, that will also give you all the information you need. You just plug in the satellite. It'll update the KEPS for you. It'll, it'll track the satellite as, as it's coming into your footprint uh, in New York. And uh, there's a downlink, an uplink, and you'll just be able to find it pretty, pretty quickly where it, where it is and when it's going to be. And it'll show you, you know, the next 20 or 30 passes. It'll be important to know, is the satellite operational, really? You can see any of the satellites in red are not operational. So you want to know, is SO50 OK? And you can see there it is in blue, and it's OK. And if you hover over that, put your mouse over that, you'll find that uh, it'll show you what stations copied it more recently. So that's important. You can see all the yellows. Those are all the telemetry satellites. And again, people have a lot of fun just copying data uh, from the satellites. So that's the next step. Is the satellite working? Really. Now you're programming the, the radio. So now you have, let's say you're using two radios, you're going to program it. Now, you know, so you're, you're looking now, okay, now I've got to worry a little bit about Doppler effect, really. And you kind of worry, what do I do about that? You know, it's the apparent change in the frequency by a wave relative motion, you know, to the source of the wave, which is a satellite, and the observer on the ground. So 
with that frequency, now how do we adjust for that? What do we do? And in the past, it perhaps was, was challenging. But what we have to do is very simple. SO50, we just have to set our presets. The transmit frequency doesn't change because Doppler isn't as sensitive at, at the higher frequency, 145.850, not a problem. You can see on the receive frequency, that point, it changes. You'll start out at 810. You see where the downlink, this was the downlink number, 795. So if you looked on the chart for SO50, you would say 795. So there are folks that'll say, you know, the satellite passed, it was a 60 degree pass. However, I didn't hear it. Well, the problem was they really started at the downlink and the satellite was already beyond them. They didn't hear anything but perhaps static or some flutter. So it's important to be able to, to adjust it. If you started at 810, Again, Doppler effect, the frequency higher or sound is, is greater as it's going. This was going now away from us as we're receiving it, and you just set those presets in place, and that's it. And now you've adjusted for the Doppler effect right there. Make sure you put in the CTCSS at 74.4, not to worry about that because that's to open up the satellite. And most of the time, by the time it gets to our area, plenty of people have been talking on the satellite, and therefore it's open already not usually an issue. 67 is a PL tone you want to make sure you, you put in there. So Doppler is, is taken care of in that case, really. Yes, that slide is available on the AMSAT website under special events, the AWRL Centennial, and uh, my PDF is there of the Centennial, so you'll be able to, to see that as, as well overall. The Faraday effect, again, as I, we, we, we talked about what really happens with that Essentially, and let's see if this comes up fine. You'll get a, you'll get an idea of what we were uh, what we were talking about with with that overall. And essentially, it's it's someone receiving uh, SO50, and they're showing us really the difference between uh, what it is when you're not really properly using you know the the, the Faraday rotation effect. And uh, yeah, it might take a little bit too uh, too, too too much time to load, so we can uh, just. Say goodbye to that for now, anyway. Anyhow, so that's the that's the, the wiggling the wrist really, as as he's doing right there, left and right. As the satellite is, is in your area, you're constantly moving it. You don't know is it left now or is it right now, so you're just moving it back and forth. It's not so important to worry about elevation, not really. You could be off, you know, by 15, 20 degrees. That's not important at all. I know people that just hold it always at a 10 degree angle. So more important, more important is. The, the wiggle to really match the Faraday rotation uh, and the polarization as it's, as it's coming down overall. So now, in review, really, okay, so we're going to amsat.org. We're looking at, at uh, their page. We're looking at passes. We're showing the predictions. Our grid square is FN30. We're putting the split frequencies in. We make sure our squelch is open. Some folks have a problem. They don't squelch open. We make sure our watch is set to UTC. We have our compass with us. We have our digital recorder with us and we listen for the calls. And of course, the Doppler is shifting a little faster on SO50 because it's a lower Leo orbit, really. And of course, the X factor, well, that could be anything. It could be your wife yelling at you, what are you doing? Your neighbors think you're weird again, you know, or people wanting to ask questions about who's up there in the satellite. So you kind of account for that. It's also important to get to the location, wherever you pick, if you haven't been there before, to look it over, picking out a couple of landmarks overall, really. So you can say that when the satellite is at 240 degrees, it's going to be by that tree. It'll be by that pole at 310. At 360, it's going to be by that tower. So you really want to really just trace that, the movement of the satellite. Check for interference. Some of the sites that you, know, you, you can go to might be noisy, and it might be difficult for really trying to receive, really, because you know, the signals aren't that powerfully strong. So you want to make sure there's not a lot of noise uh, as well. And of course, the S factor. You know, survey location. At the AWRL Centennial, you were you were rather you were at the last convention in, in Maryland. Patrick Stoddard had a little problem. And his little problem was the NSA. Right. He, we were in Washington and uh, he didn't realize that was a secure site. And all of a sudden he had what about six or seven NSA surrounded him. Right. So make sure you survey your location a little bit, really. Everything worked out well for him once they proved that he was a nutty satellite operator, but you gotta be careful really. I know, and uh, so that'll help a lot, really, overall. So, uh, and try not to do your pass too close to a Mr. Softy truck, because you won't have any peace and quiet, really, when you're doing a pass. So survey the location, really, 
overall. Now, making contacts, you listen to the satellite. You're going to pick out some calls. You pick out the calls. You're going to listen. KYSE, as an example, is very active. You're going to give your call that this is uh, Whiskey 2 Juliet Victor handheld, really, and you'll listen. And the contacts are usually quick. It's like, you know, a grid expedition or, or DX, so they're in and out. Usually just give them your grid square and your name, perhaps, and say hello. And some folks are on rover expeditions where you'll be able to pick up grid squares. You know, there's 488 grid squares in the United States, so it's, it's, it's a challenge to pick them all up, but it can be done, and we have rovers that are always around at these rare, some of these rare grid square locations. And uh, we have uh, one of the guys, Yuri, is on a boat often, and uh, Yuri's uh, in wet locations where it's very difficult to get uh, really grids in those locations. So Yuri will let us know through the AMSAT bulletin board, which is a very important resource to use to find out really when, uh, when, this, when he's going to be in operation, really. So that's overall how you're going you're gonna to handle that, really, uh, when you're making your, your contacts, really. And, uh, you know, this was, this was just a little example of a satellite contact, really. It's, it's essentially me with SO50, but there, things could go wrong. You may have the wrong glasses. Or you, oftentimes, it's watch not being synchronized. That could be the, the big problem overall, where your watch is not synchronized to UTC. Uh, latitude and longitude is important to know. When you're plugging that information to the AMSAT site, they want to know what your latitude and longitude is, or, or minimum, what your grid square is. Sometimes that could be off. Uh, or the uplink and downlink frequencies are not correct, really. Uh, or the satellite pass may be too low, or the squelch might be muted, or again, uh, your mother-in-law may be yelling at you, get back in the house, it's time to eat, type of thing. So there could be, there could be a number of things going on. I'm not going to go into long detail with this. This is really, if you really want to go the next step, these are two FT-817s, linear satellites, sideband and CW. Then you can do telemetry only. These are a couple of telemetry only satellites. Then you need all band, all mode. This is an example of FunCube which is we're copying telemetry from FunCube. You can see again, this is some interesting data collection and you're sending this information to the data collection warehouse and this is FunCube, which is based in the UK and they're really interested to know the health of the satellite when it's in the area. This is uh, Patrick's, uh, you know, you don't need a whole lot. This is what Patrick uses, his uh, two meter turnstile on a mass tripod laptop uh, used for the FunCube dongle. This is where, how he's copying information, telemetry information uh, now, he's in Phoenix, Arizona, so it's sort of unfair. He doesn't have any, too many obstacles, really, to worry about. The ISS fan club, now, this is interesting to go to because you can make, you know, Doug Wheelock was very active uh, on, involved with that. However, uh, you know, you can, you can certainly do a DigiP through that as well, if you want, or you'll be able to have contacts ahead of time uh, before school contacts occur, as another example, really. These are some of the resources we mentioned. That's the AMSAT website. That's the mailing list that would be act good to go to, and, uh, or the ARRL, or Starcom Group is another good resource as well. There's software available, you know, that you can, you can have. There's, they're all good, some of them you have to pay for, but, uh, you know, Heavens Above is free. You know, the iPad, Hamsat HD. You know, you have your favorite. Free Amsat Droid is a pretty good one. Do you have that one? That's a pretty nice one to use overall. But there's no, there's no hard and fast rule which one you might use. Here's some screenshots really of some of the software that's uh, that's available Nova's free as well we do have satellites on the way I mean we have certainly in 2015 this year will be a busy year for satellites and launches overall so we're looking forward to if people are saying well there's not that much going on up there hopefully uh, within the next second and third quarter of this year we'll have we'll have a few more satellites in orbit and that's it folks thank you thank you very much we have a couple of minutes left just a couple any questions at all Overall, yes. Uh, SO50 is 450 milliwatts, and 850 milliwatts will be the will be our power budget for Fox One. So it's going to be it's going to be about the same as uh, AO51. So it's going to be it's going to be fine. Good, good question. Thank you. Yes. Well, sir, the question is, have we done any work with circularly polarized antennas? Well, here's one. Here's, this is the ELK. This is a circularly polarized antenna. It doesn't look, you know, as you typically might want it, but this is, is an antenna that a duplexer is not needed for this. So, and it's very effective. Circularly polarized, disc cones, the arrow antenna, which is a standard Yagi antenna. So they all work. Are there, could you 
define differences, improvements one over the other, not really. They're all good antenna systems. It comes down to you know, what you like to use, trial and error. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Well, you, th at that point, you can use an MH72 duplexer uh, by Comet. The Comet makes the MH72, I believe. And so you'll, you'll connect a duplexer. At that point, you can know it starts to get to a point where I may need a little bridge table here to operate. But it's okay. That, you can do it out of the back of your car. But yes, the difference. Now, if you have an arrow antenna, the arrow has a built-in duplexer. So you can, you can make your connections off the arrow antenna without the need for a duplexer. The power budget, the, the most power you can run through an arrow is about 10 watts. But with an elk, there's no limit. So if you want to run more power, if you want to, you, you certainly can with that. Really. But that's good. Good question. Not at all. Anything else? Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much again. Thanks for your time. I appreciate that. And uh, any more questions you have, you can email me, certainly, or look at the AMSAT website. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.